The levels are set. The mics are ready. Testing, testing, one, two, three. So strap yourself in. It's time to go one-on-one with Bill Alexander. Let's go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this edition of One on One with Bill Alexander. Once again, you get to see me and you get to see my guests, which I know for some of you, you'd rather just see my guest. But hey, you got to take the good with the bad. Now, this next person that I have with me, if you type her name into Google, the first thing that comes up is her Instagram feed and photographs of Jamie Beebe. Jamie, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you. I'm, I'm great. Thanks for having me. Um, I think it's interesting when you look, when you look at it, you search for you, there are you in different types of dress, but I think the ones you're most famous for are your beach photos in your bikini. (laughs) Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in a bikini. It's true. (laughs) I do. I travel a lot. I, 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 I was noticing that because I also follow you on Instagram and I noticed that you are pretty much on the road constantly, which must be a really nice lifestyle for you because a lot of people don't have that luxury. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, everyone is kind of looking for a different end goal, I guess, or whatever in life. Um, and mine is traveling. So I make sure to make that happen as much as possible. So I was also, when I, when I go on, I always, uh, try to do some research um, on a guest that most people don't talk about. And I came across a few things that you actually were in a couple of movies. Oh, not, I mean, like, <laughs> wow, not really. I cannot act. Um, my, I was like an extra in like two movies and I, I didn't do even a good job at that. So well, the I may have, I, I think I was cut out of them, in fact. The one I see is I have a photo of you in the movie Come Together. Oh, um, yeah. And of I course, think I was an a, extra. <laughs> yeah, and of course, you're wearing a blue bikini. Now, my <laughs> question is the hair on your head looks like a wig. Did you dye it or was it a wig? No, they, they put me in a wig. I was in I a could, wig. I could tell because it looked very awkward. So it must have been a very low budget film. It was. <laughs> so what made you decide? I mean, you said acting is not your strong point. What made you decide to be a casting director? Um, you know, it was, it was kind of random. Uh, I start. I was doing production. I was working, had a production at this company, um, and I had never actually worked in production or in film at, at all. And um but I, I got hired to be head of production. So I had to kind of learn every aspect of it um, and all the different parts and working parts and what everybody does. And it's a very small company. So I also did all the casting. Um, and when that company disbanded, I was like, okay, I'm just going to be a casting director because that's like the best job. Like everybody loves the casting director. Like everyone's nice to the casting director. When I call, people are, <laughs> are excited to hear from me because I'm probably going to give them, you know, a part in a movie or something. So, right. um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so I, I wanted something, I wanted a happy job, like something that was, you know, cool and I could like make people happy and, um, and was fun for me. So how long have you been a casting director? Um, probably a little over 10, oh, probably more than 10 years now uh 10 to 15 years i've been working so what you started when you were 15 or what how's this work exactly that's exactly (laughs) it (laughs) i mean that for for a 15 year old to get that much respect that's impressive it really is uh no i'm i'm in my 40s now so so yeah i was i was definitely an adult when i started I wish I was in my 40s. Anyhow, um, I'm looking over some of the credits that you actually have done dealing with casting. And you actually, um, one of the big ones here was Big Brother. Um, you work with casting on all 40 episodes, correct? Um, I don't know how many episodes, um, how many seasons I worked on for that. There was a few. Uh, you know, for when I was doing reality, I started out in reality um, and I do scripted now, 
But when I did reality, I, I worked on so many shows. It was crazy. Um, I, you know, I recruited for a lot of shows. Um, I was casting producer on a lot of shows. Like, uh, I think for Big Brother, I was, I was just kind of recruiting. And uh, I went through hundreds and hundreds of people just to, to find one in a million there. So is it easier to cast for a written program or a reality program? Um, they're two totally different things, really. Um, you wouldn't think so, but you know, when you're casting for reality, you're really looking for that needle in a haystack. Like, you know, you're looking for somebody so specific that there's like five of those people total and you have to find the one that, that fits and wants to come on the show and they're available. And, um, you know, so you're looking at just normal everyday people, um, that want to do that. Whereas with the scripted stuff, you know, I deal more with agents and managers. It's more on the business end of things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to go out and make anybody famous or, you know, that sometimes reality shows kind of do that. Um, but yeah, so it's totally two completely different jobs, even though they're both called casting. Which one would you rather do? Um, I mean, I, I'm definitely where I'm at now in, with doing scripted. I, I okay. prefer scripted, but doing the reality was so fun. Like there was some times when it was just like so much fun. Um, and it's, it's really creative. And I, I liked the creative aspect of that because it's a lot different than, than the creativeness and doing scripted. Um, but I think for me, I just, uh, I fit better into the scripted world. Uh, I'd rather work I guess with actors, like, I don't want to go out and like try and convince people to like be okay. on this crazy reality show and right. date somebody on TV. You know, it was fun when I was a little younger and I was like, oh, I would probably do it too, you know? Uh -huh. and, and, you know, maybe I would have, who knows? Um, luckily I did not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I'd rather work with, you know, these actors that like, this is their, their lifelong goal. This is their career. This is something that they're working towards. And, um, and I want to help along, you know, be that stepping stone for them. So what background do you need to be a casting director? Or just being able to talk to people? <laughs> well, that certainly helps. That's, that's one of the best uh, parts is, you know, you have to talk to people all day long. Um, I don't, you know, I, I do have a master's degree, um, not in casting. I don't know if you can get one. I, I have a master's degree in music management and a bachelor's okay. degree in photography. So, um, I think, you know, just it's, it's a lot about just common sense, uh, and relationships, like knowing the right agents and managers and, you know, and having that common sense, like, you know, and, and that creative aspect to like be able to help the director and the producers and, and, you know, put the right people in the right places. So you made you made the comment that you have a master's in music management. Did you look at going into that direction or are you still looking at because you're still, in my opinion, still early in your career? Uh, no, no. I looked at it. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, manage bands for some reason. I thought okay. that would just be like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> um, and I think it, it could have been cool. Uh, just it wasn't for me. Um, it's a it's a different ballgame. You know, musicians are are a lot different than actors. Um, and, you know, while it seems like it would probably be a lot of fun, uh, it just wasn't really my thing. I love music. I love listening to music. I think music makes the whole world go around, but I cannot manage uh, musicians at all. <laughs> okay. Um, how did your, how did your line of work change during this past year and a half of the lockdown that we were in with COVID? Um, it, you know, it, it, it's coming back with a vengeance. Um, I think we all took a little time off. Uh, during that time, you know, I did start my own podcast um, and it took off, it, it did really well. So I stayed busy, um, you know, and, and with the casting, you know, we did take some time off from film. I think all of LA just kind of took some time off from filming. And I think it was good. I think a lot of creativity came out of that. Um, a lot of people were like posting their monologues on Instagram because they were bored. Um, right. But I was watching them. I was sitting at home watching them because I was bored too. And, you know, I, I got to know a lot of new actors, a lot of new faces. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's really coming back. I've, I've been swamped lately. I've been super busy. It feels great to be so busy. Um, so I think that, you know, now that it's back, uh, 
I think we're doing things a little bit differently. You know, we're still, everyone's still being really careful and um, there's less in-person meetings, which is kind of cool. Cause then, you know, if I'm in one spot all day and I don't have to drive around town and have meetings then I can get a lot more done, <laughs> it's nice. Well, yeah, the technology has really uh, changed in the last year and a half. Um, mm -hmm. As I told my last guest last week, that um, when I started in this business, I started, I went to college for radio. That was the only way you could get on. Started in radio 40 years ago. And then all of a sudden this ch this technology change that now I can finally see my guest and not talk to him on a telephone because yeah. always there was this disjointed voice on the end of the line and you didn't know what they were doing when you were talking to them or uh, if they were focused or what whatever was going on. But it's good. I like this. It's much better. So you have a podcast, which is a very interesting podcast called Strictly Stalking. What got you interested in stalking? And please tell me you were not stalked. I was not stalked. Okay. Um, no, I have never had a stalker. Luckily, thankfully. Um, I I really, you know, I listen to a ton of podcasts. I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts, um, especially when I'm going to bed at night, which I know people think is strange, but they kind of help me sleep. Um, and one day, you know, I, I call my business partner up and um, you know, we we're talking about doing different movies and, you know, producing some films and things like that. And I called him up and I was like, I really want to do a podcast. Um, I want to do a true, true crime podcast and all the good murder ones like are already done. Like everyone's already done all the, my favorite murder things. And so, um, you know, what, what should I do? What could I possibly do? It's over for me, you know, and my business partner, who's very, very logical, his name is Jake Deptula. And so he sat back for a second. He goes, well, you know, no one's talking about stalking. There's no podcasts about stalking. And I was like, stalking? Like, I don't even know anything about stalking. Like, I'm not doing that. And I hung up. And then, of course, like, what happens every time I speak to him? So I start thinking, and I'm like, so there's, like, a whole crime out there, and I don't know anything about it? Like, that's weird. Um, and no one's talking. Like, there's this whole crime that affects millions of people, and no one's talking about it. So I started doing some research um and within a few days i had you know written out like a um a deck to go and and send off and um and we signed with a podcast company and then a few months later we we started releasing the show and it was it's just been great ever since and you know and once we started talking to people and interviewing people and and talking about what being stalked is really like um a lot of things changed for us and it became so much less about making a podcast and more about like bringing awareness and, you know, trying to change the laws and, you know, do something for these people to help them because people that are being stalked, they don't have help. They're not getting help from the police. Oftentimes they're not, they're not getting enough justice. So when you do the podcast, and like I said, I, I've listened to a few of them. And I also noticed that you have a YouTube channel too. Do you rather do, would you rather just do them as the audio because you don't really have to worry about what you look like, what the guests look like, anything else? Or do you like being on camera? We actually stopped doing the YouTube um, show okay. a, a few months ago um, because it was, it was just, it's difficult. A lot of our guests are anonymous, um, you know, for uh, safety reasons. And, and yeah, I just think it was kind of di distracting in a way. Um, it's not about, you know, seeing anything. It's about, I think it's when you can only hear it, it, it adds that, um, that other flavor that you need sometimes to like sit and close your eyes and like think, because a lot of the things, you know, it's very, the stories are extremely traumatic and they're extremely triggering for a lot of people. Um, and I think seeing it is just like, it's a, it's such a different form than just hearing it. Yeah. It gives you that theater of the mind that you can actually, you can either picture it being, more um, more intense than it actually was, or maybe less because you have a different way of looking at things. The 911 calls that you use, are they the real 911 calls? Yeah. Yeah. Any any 911 calls that we've used are the real ones. Um, any Anything like that that we've used have been the real ones. It's pretty scary, now, is it, huh? <laughs> is there any guess that you've done since the beginning that sticks out with you? Um, I mean, yeah, you know, we still talk to like all of our guests. It's it's like a weird community that we've kind of been drawn into. Um, sadly, you know, they these people don't have a choice 
of being in this community, uh, a lot of our guests kind of reach out to each other too um, for advice and and to help each other out. Um, so they all kind of stick out, you know, in one way or another. Um, you know, of course, like Lenora Clara, one of the very first people that we interviewed. Um, she's a great friend of ours now. Uh, so glad to know her. She's such a huge advocate for stalking. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that it's so important to highlight the work that she's done. You know, and instead of running and hiding and being scared, like she stood up and she held her ground and she still deals with her soccer on a daily basis. Um, but she's such an advocate. She has, she now works her, her entire life to help other people. So how do you find the people that are on your program? Because I doubt there's a phone book that says these people have been stalked. I mean, if they want their identity hidden or not released, how do you bring them out of the shadows to get them on the program? Yeah, I mean, that's something that's really difficult that we have run into. Um, You know, people don't want to talk about it for a variety of reasons. Either they are you know, still in fear for their lives. Um, a lot of people that are stalked, as we know it, it can, it's slow murder. You're being hunted by another human being. Um, so sometimes they're in fear for their lives. They don't want to come forward or um, they don't know about us. You know, they don't know that there's somewhere that they can speak out and, and talk about what's going on. Or, you know, it's simply too traumatic and triggering to, to keep talking about. Um, so there's a variety of a variety of reasons why people don't come forward but what we have found is that the people that do come forward and do talk to us um you know for a lot of them it can it can really help it helps with the healing process and then it also helps because you're helping other people um it's so sad to have to go through something like this you shouldn't have to go through something like this at all um but unfortunately it is what it is and people you know for some of for some people out there they do have to go through this and, you know, it, it helps to know that you can help other people um, with, when you have to deal with it, you know, and, and a lot of people that go through stalking, they become advocates because it's such a hard thing to navigate. I mean, you have to prove there's a crime being put up against you. Like, what other crime do we have to try to prove, you know? Right. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, it's against, it's a lot of against women and, you know, there's a lot of crimes against women that we have to deal with, um, you know, that we don't get have adequate, adequate support for. Um, the, I have a 14 year old daughter. And one of the things that I know is happening now with social media and stuff like that, there are teenagers and young adults being stalked online. Have you dealt with any of those types of situations on the podcast as of yet? Yeah, you know, we have, um, we've dealt both with some younger people and a lot of online stalking. Um, You know, with how technology is, it's so easy to anonymously stalk somebody, Um, you know, you can make fake profiles and, and, you know, do all do all of that. And unfortunately, it's a reality that we live in. Um, And it does happen a lot with the younger kids. I think a lot of it is harassment and bullying that maybe like turns into stalking or, you know, it's it's a lot more harassment and bullying side of things. And it can be really detrimental for, you know, for a teenager. So with that being said, what recommendations do you have for people that think they might be being stalked? Um, Number one is just document everything. Uh, No matter what it is, no matter how insignificant it is, your full-time job is now to document every little thing that happens. Um, If you get in your car and the tires are slashed, I mean, I guess that's kind of a big one, but you know, you document that. Um, Every hang up phone call that you get, you document that. Every online threat you get, you document that. Every, you know, weird text you get, you you have to document every, everything that happens, um, which is utterly time consuming. And it, it sucks, you know, to be honest, it sucks. It's not, it's not fair in any way, but that's the only way to really get the cops to take a look um, is to bring them this book full of things that you've documented and this is what's going on. And then, you know, you also have to kind of be the squeaky wheel in these situations where when you do go to the, to law enforcement, 
you know, if the first officer is not listening to you, get the next officer and then you try another officer, you get another, you know, until someone sits down and listens to you and takes it seriously, you just have to be like that squeaky wheel. You have to keep calling, you have to keep trying, you know, and, and unfortunately for stalking victims, being a victim becomes your full-time job oftentimes just to, in order to get any type of justice. Now, after watching medical shows and stuff like that, I always feel that I have the phantom ailment that they're talking about this week. Have you ever listened to one or interviewed one of the people and go, hey, wait a minute, may I, maybe I've been stalked at one time before? Um, no, I mean, I think for, for me, like with the knowledge that I have, it's very clear cut. Um, you know, the, the lines of stalking um, are pretty clear okay. for me, but a lot of our, a lot of the, the stalking stories that we cover are like intimate partner stalking. Um, you know, and I've, I've been in a, you know, my last relationship was just utterly horrible. Um, and so it, it can be, for me, sometimes it can be really triggering, you know, when I, when I talk to these other women about like the domestic violence and things that they've experienced that did turn into stalking, like, thankfully my relationship didn't turn that way. Um, but you know, it was, you know, along with, just being horrible and, and, you know, having domestic violence involved in a relationship, um, you know, I can definitely relate on that level. So Jamie, let's take this in another direction. So I'm looking at your Instagram page right now. Do you consider yourself a media influencer? No, I don't think so. I, I, you know, I think that my podcast is, um, is more of the influencer than I am, uh, you know, cause we get to, we get to, you know, help people and, you know, really make a difference. But I, I don't know about the whole Instagram influencer thing. If anyone's really making a difference, um, I guess like I, I literally just post photos of myself. Like I'm not telling anyone, I'm not influencing anyone to like do anything. Because I, I can honestly see there's a few photos on you on vacation and um, holding different alcoholic beverages <laughs> in your hand. And I'm wondering if at that moment that someone sees it, that their that, that their uh, sales increase just by enough to say, hey, where's this coming from? Because um, I, I, I think <laughs> I, I think it's it. interesting. I have no idea. Um I, I definitely enjoy my beverages, uh, especially on vacation. Uh, and it's fun. You know, I, a lot of people ask kind of about my Instagram, which is interesting to me. Um, I post what I'm doing on a daily level, except okay. better. So like, if I'm just sitting on my couch working, that's probably not the photo you're going to get. But I do, you know, I go out a lot. I, I have a, a hot tub in my backyard. That's the photo you're going to get because that's way more fun. You know, I try and Instagram's not real um, to, to an extent, obviously. Okay. Like I'm only, I'm only going to post like happy, fun things where I look amazing. Like I'm not going to post like things where I wake up and my hair looks like crap, you know, <laughs> like that's, I don't want to do that. Um, so yeah, you know, in, in a lot of respects, like I just don't really believe that social media is a real thing. Um, even for me, it's like, it's kind of like a fun game where I'm like, okay, like I'm only going to post awesome, happy crap, you know, you're going to post your best life as someone told me once. Exactly. So your dog. Yeah. How old is your dog? <laughs> he is five. Um, if you, if you look back far enough, you'll see his fourth birthday party. Okay. Um, last october so he's well he's almost five he'll be five next month because i i whenever i was booking this that was the first thing that drew me to you was the dog because <laughs> i have two dogs i have a uh, black uh, dutch shepherd who is just turned three and i have a collie mix also black that just turned two so i'm also Aww. a dog lover so when you go on these trips do you take the dog with you or do you have to have someone keep stay with it um, if I drive, I take him with me. Uh, and if I fly, no, I leave him home. Although I, I just uh, recently got back from Honduras and the whole time I was like, he would have had so much fun here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, I mean, it's an interesting. Island, you know, he could have just ran around and just had a blast with all the other dogs. Um, 
yeah when you go on trips now honduras to me i i'm lucky if i make it down the east coast <laughs> but these places you go have you been there before or are these just new experiences I try to keep going to new places because um, I, I just, the thrill of seeing a new place is amazing. Um, I just booked tickets to Greece. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I have actually been to Honduras. I went to Honduras once before about eight years ago. Okay. Um, and so I haven't, you know, the trips, I, I normally travel by my, I travel by myself a lot, which I, I guess is interesting for a lot of people. Um, and I love it. I love traveling by myself, but there's also, you know, sometimes there's, it can get a little sketchy. There's a safety aspect of it. You know, you got to stay a little bit on your toes being a, a girl traveling alone. So um, since I've been to Honduras before, I decided to to start there this time around and, um, and, you know, spend some time there alone. And it kind of got, got me going like, I should go a few more places alone. You know, I go, cause lately I've, I've been hitting, places up with my girlfriends, which is super fun. Um, but it's a whole different type of travel when you go with someone. So have you ever thought about doing a travel podcast? Because and, and doing them from each location you go on? Um, you know, it's crossed my mind. Uh, I think it'd be really fun. But also, as you know, podcasts are like a full time job. They are, they are not that easy to put together. Um, it's it's hard doing a podcast is, is so much work it's so hard it's so much work so as much fun as a travel podcast would be I do not have it in my time to do it um I wish I did I wish I did but you know casting full-time podcasting full-time and then also trying to travel full-time is like really it's tough yeah <laughs> so how many places do you go a year or is it just whenever you get the mood to go um, I, right now I've, I'm trying to do one trip a month, which I know oh, wow. is a lot more than, than a lot of people. Um, but I also, you know, I, I'm not always staying at like five-star hotels and, you know, right. like when I went to Honduras, like I was like backpacking through and, um, you know, I, when I'm by myself, it's, it's kind of just different. Like I don't eat it. I don't eat that much. So I don't have to like go to all the fancy restaurants, you know, it just kind of depends. So it's not like I'm out there like spending a ton of money, but um, I think traveling done, um, traveling can, can be done in a lot of different ways. And sometimes I go and I can, if I find a cheap plane ticket, I can just kind of head out on my own and like do my own thing. And it can be pretty inexpensive. It sounds to me like you need to write a book now. Um. <laughs> How to Travel on the Dime. I think that's the name of the book. Um, so uh, going uh, when you go overseas, when you fly, what is the most interesting place you've ever been to? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I, I love Cambodia. I think Cambodia is super, super cool. Um, I went to Angkor, Angkor Wat, and I was just kind of in Southeast Asia, traveling through and um decided to swing over there and just like I was like well I'm so close to it for a while I was like an hour flight away so I was like oh I'll just do it um and I went and it was so cool like the people there were just so nice and like awesome and um seeing in Wat was just a tremendous experience it was absolutely gorgeous and it's one of those places where you you feel it you know you when you're there you just feel it and um, and also it's very inexpensive. I mean, I had this, I got this hotel that was like, I mean, it was huge. I think there's like 10 pools. I, I don't even know if I found all the pools while I was there. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was like $40 a night, you know? So it was, it was pretty nice being in, in Cambodia. So, okay. Now let's talk about the United States. What's the best place you stay? Uh, Maui. <laughs> Maui. Oh, that doesn't count. No, that, that's still no on the mainland. Oh no. You know, I haven't traveled too much. Um, I've, I've like driven through the United States, but never really okay. like, um, stopped a lot, but you know, I, it's interesting. I, I'll get nostalgic sometimes like from, from the Midwest. Cause that's where I grew up. Um, you know, in the season, not winter, but like the other seasons, uh, so sometimes, you know, I like to go back and visit family and, and actually see the Midwest. And if I'm not mistaken, you're from Iowa. Yep. That's very flat. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing there. There's nothing there. They have seasons. They have seasons. Yeah. Although my parents, um, they live in Wisconsin now. So um, when I go back, there's very few times of the year that it's not freezing cold. Gotcha. Well, I live in Western Pennsylvania. I'm just South of the city of Pittsburgh. So nothing here is flat. It's all hilly <laughs> and uh, like that. So I'm not familiar with flat land. It's only when I drive anywhere outside of the state of Pennsylvania, because it seems like it goes on forever, but anyhow, Jamie, I know you're busy and I know you squeezed me in today. So I'm going <laughs> to let you go a little bit early because we tried to get this on for a long time. And I'm so I glad know. you're able to join me today. And I really appreciate it. Uh, when your life slows down a little bit, maybe when you retire, which I <laughs> doubt it will happen, then you can come back on again. But um, again, thank you very much. I really appreciate you being with me today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me and, and putting that time in. Uh, you have a great day, and we'll talk to you next time. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. A big thank you to Jamie Beebe for joining me today here one-on-one -on -one with Bill Alexander. If you'd like to find out more about Jamie, you can stop by her casting website at jamiecasting.com, or you can check out her podcast at any of your favorite podcast providers like iTunes, Google Podcast, stuff like that. And all you have to do is look for Strictly Stalking. Again, that's Strictly Stalking. Or you could just search for her in Google. And the name again is Jamie BB. So, Jamie, thank you very much for joining me today. I greatly appreciate it. We'll be back next time here one on one with Bill Alexander.